Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here again. Actually, I was lucky enough to be here last year to uh, present, and the organizers should certainly be congratulated for putting together a better program uh, this year, and I would really like to thank them for uh, inviting me back. As somebody from North America, we, we pay very close attention to what's happening over here, and you should really be congratulated because you are often ahead of the curve as far as we're concerned, and uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here to present our data. Well, as you, the title of the symposium is, is about recovery, and, 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 and I think it's an extremely important concept. Uh, what I'm going to present is perhaps not as elegant as, as what we're doing with the Impella, but equally as important, because I think it's really going to set the groundwork um, for the recovery concept. You've seen some of the data, certainly for Europe, but this is the data for the United States in terms of, of myocardial infarction. And why are we jumping up and down about recovery? Why are we looking at these things? Well, there's clearly a lot of patients out there that can benefit either from Impella technology or the next level, total circulatory support, which is what I'm going to talk about. And you can see here <clears throat> 18,000 device candidates a year, yet we're only seeing maybe 2 to 5 percent of this population. So there's clearly a, a group of patients out there that we're missing, and, and hopefully uh, symposia like this are going to help educate uh, our cardiology colleagues and surgical colleagues that there's a lot of patients out there that we can really help. The, the other side of that is, is um, that the, these patients don't do well, or the patients that are really sick and that fail balloon pumps, fail ionotropes, don't do well. And the mortality, and this is a graph from Dr. Samuels here, you, you will... Uh, hear from later who's really been a leader and a, and a mentor for me that shows that these patients that are that sick that are failing don't do well with mortality rates in the 80 or 90 percent range. So there's a lot of them and they're not doing well and we need to do something about them. <clears throat> I am lucky enough uh, to present here for you and this was some data that we presented at the TCT last year and on behalf of my uh, the co-investigators of the data that we have in terms of the use of the AB5000 for patients with acute uh, cardiogenic shock from acute myocardial infarction. This is a multi-center U.S. Uh, experience. And really what we wanted to do is, is very basic in terms of just assessing the survival and the recovery outcomes of this patient population that were supported with the VADs, and namely the Abiumed AB5000. Uh, 100 patients now, 42 U.S. centers. As you can see, obviously 100 patients, 42 U.S. centers. Uh, we had a, a, an array of enrollment in terms of the trial. So we did have some centers with uh, single patients and, and some centers with obviously uh, a higher number of patients. This was a, a voluntary database and a retrospective review, which is, I guess, a, a bad thing. On the other hand, this is a database that took all comers and there were really nobody was excluded from this from a, a particular center or for any other particular reason. So this is all comers. And as I had uh, mentioned, this is the AB5000 patients that were implanted uh, ultimately with the AB5000 over about a three-year period. <clears throat> we looked at the standard things in terms of patient variables, uh, implant characteristics, and survival, importantly, was measured at 30 days. Recovery, also the important point here, is what we're talking about. <laughs> Was, was considered unassisted native cardiac function. No inotropes, no intraaortic balloon pump. Uh, I, we haven't seen much of this yet today. You're going to hear more about it, but obviously the AB5000 and, and taking a step back, the BVS5000, which was the workhorse, which has been around for a long time and has been the workhorse for this type of uh, support. And now, uh, from my point of view, is, has really been replaced by the AB5000, which is really proven itself in terms of its ability to provide total circulatory support, ease of use, um, hemocompatibility, and so on. Uh, extremely good technology. An important point in this patient population in, in, in terms of um, this, this group, a lot, uh, as you can see, a, a lot of these patients, over half of them were transferred from outside institutions to so-called hub institutions, and a lot of them, nearly half of them, were initially um, placed on the BVS 5000 and then transferred uh, to the AB 5000. 
and, and this historically has been a problem because reoperation in this setting in a patient that's acutely ill, maybe a day or two into uh, cardiogenic shock, acute myocardial infarction, reoperation to change out from devices um, can be met with a significant mortality rate. Uh, here we had no mortalities uh, in terms of changing from the BVS 5000 to the AB 5000. It's really become a bedside procedure, which is, I think, an extremely important thing to remember. Patient population is as you would expect in terms of uh, a standard acute myocardial in infarction population in terms of age and uh, a male bias. You can see as we've been talking about revascularization, the importance of revascularization in this setting, basically all of these patients were revascularized, which I, I, I do believe is an important thing. We'll talk about it a little more later. And obviously these patients were quite ill. To reinforce the fact how ill these patients were, you can see the breakdown in terms of uh, how they were appearing to the operating room in terms of uh, inotropic requirements, CPR, patients that had VTAC or VF. Um, and, and here, obviously, evidence of significant um, shock that's gone on for a while with evidence of end organ dysfunction already. In terms, I mentioned already that uh, we had a significant transfer, uh, transition from the BVS to the AB5000 and not a um, surprising breakdown in terms of LVADs, BIVADs, and, and RVADs. Uh, and an important slide here, when I showed you about the hyperbilirubinemia or, or elevated creatinine, the, uh, over 50% of these patients were in shock for 24 hours, of which we all know is cl clearly a bad problem, clearly associated with bad outcomes. So this patient population, as you can see now, quite ill and had been, and the majority of them had been ill for quite some time before implantation with the device. Here you can see the hemodynamics, certainly no surprise. We're talking about a device that can take over, we're talking about complete total circulatory support now, and, and this is basically what you're seeing in terms of uh, pre-device and, and post-device. And uh, the, the third column, uh, these are the patients that did recover. These are their recovery hemodynamics, unassisted hemodynamics, which you can see really um, are quite good and, and actually quite normal. So here is the, the meat of the matter. What did we have in terms of outcome survival and more importantly recovery? Well, outcomes, 30-day uh, survival, 40%, which if you look at this patient population, you saw how sick they are, you saw what the, the historical data is, we've probably doubled survival. Uh, is 40% good enough? Uh, probably not. And I think we can do better and we'll talk about that. But the most important thing, of the survivors, we were able to have them recover cardiac function, unassisted cardiac function, in 63% of them. This is something that's really never been reported, uh, extremely important concept, and is really, hopefully, going to be one of the bases or basis of, of this symposium, is that recovery can become uh, a reality. I, I failed to mention this, uh, which is a, an extremely important point of this slide, which was something that was surprising to me, having had a, a great deal of experience with this technology, yet weaning these patients at five, seven, nine days. But as you can see here, the, the average time for recovery is quite long which was surprising to me, and I think extremely important data. And, and, and when we're talking about the Impella device, short-term devices now, and we're looking at these patients with an average time of recovery of 25 days, I think this is, these are important topics that we need to talk about in terms of how this whole spectrum is going to play out. And I think that's an important concept for most of us because early on in my uh, practice, I was transplanting in this time frame. And putting a patient on a device for a couple of days and transplanting. And that's, again, what happened here. And, and I think the reality of it is, is we're not giving these patients enough time to recover. And I, I think the data is now pretty clear that these patients, perhaps not all, and we'll talk about how to perhaps figure out who's going to need longer time for recovery, but clearly they need more time than we initially thought. In terms of trying to figure out who survived, who didn't, it, this is certainly very intuitive. The patients who uh, were getting CPR and had lower arterial blood pressures and, and had a higher percentage of ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions, the sicker patients were not the ones that, uh, the, were the ones that didn't do well. 
Uh, I think this is an important slide in terms of uh, recovery is sustainable. I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about why I think that we can do better with this. It's only 75%. We don't have all the follow-up data. This is only on the first 50 patients. 75% one-year survival, perhaps not high enough. I do think we can do better than that. But I do think it will be ultimately sustainable. Just to, I wanted to, you heard about the shock trial. I want to mention it quickly because one of the criticisms, even though I showed you the data of how sick these patients were, was, you know, how do these patients compare to a benchmark study? You, you guys are just putting this out there. Is it, are these patients really sick enough? Or are you just giving us a series of patients that probably would have survived with an Impella 2.5 or a balloon pump? So we compared the shock trial, and, and it is uh, what, what we consider a, a benchmark trial, and looked at the patients in the shock trial who failed and died, and then compared our patients that received a, the, um, who failed and then received a, a ventricular assist device and survived. And you can see very clearly, which was very reassuring to us, that actually the patients uh, who survived getting a ventricular assist device were actually sicker than the patients who died. So this clearly um, solidifies the fact that these patients were really sick and how much the ventricular assist device helped them in terms of not only getting them to survive, but furthermore, recovering ventricular function. So all this is well and good, and I think this is hopefully going to open up some discussion about what we're talking about, revascularization, unloading. What are we doing for these patients with either the Impella or the AV5000? And this is a, a paper out of Japan that was just recently published that, that caught my eye and I think is, is really important. Historically, the heart was not viewed as an organ that could uh, heal itself. There, were, there weren't many cardiac stem cells present. There weren't many proliferative, proliferative cardiomyocytes present. So the, the heart was felt that it couldn't repair itself. Well, there is some data to suggest that this is not true, that there act, actually are stem cells uh, present and there are some uh, proliferative cardiomyocytes present. So the heart may actually be able to uh, have some regenerative function. The problem is that the, the ratio in, in the heart is, is off. There's not many proliferative cardiomyocytes present. So when you're in a setting of acute myocardial infarction with significant myocyte loss, the low percentage of proliferative cardiomyocytes is not enough to afford appreciative cardiac repair. And in this setting, in the setting of acute infarction with mechanical stress, the failing heart, this sets up that, that milieu where these proliferative cardiomyocytes cannot, uh, don't have the ability to dominate and heal the heart. But perhaps under favorable conditions, this can occur. And so what these um, investigators did, they took mice, ligated the LAD for an hour, transplanted it heterotopically, the heart, and unloaded it, and then left the other heart in place, obviously to, to have the failing heart model. And then they took these hearts out at three days, seven days, 14, and 28 days. What they saw is kind of what we've already seen in some data in terms of limitation of infarct size and in terms of uh, having a thicker, wa greater wall thickness in the unloaded heart and in terms of infarction area, less infarction area in the unloaded heart. But more importantly, what they saw is in terms of um, presence of proliferating cells, and, and these are the, the, um, um, the mitotic cardiomyocytes. In the unloaded heart, there was a significantly higher number of these mitotic cardiomyocytes in the unloaded heart. And in terms of stem cells, now this is just a, a marker for, um, oh, I'm sorry, a apoptosis. I don't want to skip over this because I think apoptosis is an extremely important concept for long-term survival and what we're trying to avoid or prevent. But anyway, they saw a, a, obviously a decreased level of apoptosis, markers for apoptosis in the unloaded heart. And finally, in terms of the stem cells, this is immunostating for a marker for stem cell uh, recruitment, but they, did, they were able to demonstrate actual stem cells and being significantly higher in the unloaded heart. So I think this is very elegant data and it's going to play a role in what we're talking about in terms of revascularize, unload, but I think now this is really important for us in terms of recovery because recovery can be quite, it's real, it's a real concept 
and it, 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 it can be documented histologically. It's not just uh, unloading these hearts and, and having, you know, I think having end organ pr function preserved is extremely important, but these hearts can heal themselves and unloading these hearts, you do see increasing cell proliferation and apoptosis and stem cell recruitment. R really exciting stuff. So I think in terms of what we're talking about now, we do need to have a paradigm shift. Um, it's not bridge to transplant anymore, it's bridge to recovery. And we were just, that, this was just brought up, whether it's revascularization or, or unloading. I don't know, but I'm inclined to favor unloading personally. And we may not be talking about door to balloon in the future versus door to unloading times in terms of these patients. Um, so finally, I think this was, is, is really exciting stuff in terms of what we can do for these patients. I think there's no question that we can improve survival in these patients and restore hemodynamics, uh, preserve end organ function. We can preserve ventricular function. I think this is very exciting. When do we, who's, who's ready to be weaned? Who, who's going to need a long-term device? I think there's going to be tools for us to use to assess these patients to decide who needs to go on to a longer-term device. Clearly, the intervention, uh, early intervention is critical, but I still think bridge to recovery needs to be the primary focus. Thank you.